I think we got it backwards in the U.S. I think that's why the trajectory of the rejection of the historic Christian faith is skyrocketing. We're depending on these traditional, additional approaches. Just invite your friends out to youth group. Well, less and less kids are coming out to youth group because they can play games on their phone right now, and they get their friends through their social media contacts, and they're busy. Hey everyone, welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast. Today we're going to hear an amazing story of redemption involving things like fatherlessness, drugs, gangs, bootleggers, even Yankees with Southern accents, and more. So every once in a while, I really like to put the gospel on display and interview people who've encountered salvation in perhaps a unique way, an unusual way. And today we're going to talk with Greg Steer, who has a thriving ministry to young people. He's really passionate about evangelism. And so we're We're going to hear his story, and then we're going to talk about how we can get over our fear of sharing the gospel, right? Sometimes I think we hear that word evangelism, and it's just like this big, looming word, the big E word, evangelism, sharing my faith, and can be so intimidating. And it is for me as well to to share the gospel with people in person. Sometimes those conversations can feel forced. So he's going to help us to get over ourselves, get over our fear of evangelism. And he's been in youth ministry now for over 20 five years. He has spoken to over a million teens. He's the founder of Dare to Share Ministries, and he's got a new book coming out called Unlikely Fighter, the story of how a fatherless street kid overcame violence, chaos, and confusion to become a radical Christ follower. So Greg, how are you? So glad to have you on the show today. Elisa, so glad to be here with you. I'm a yeah. big fan of all that you do. You're a gift to the body of Christ. Oh, man. Well, I, I feel the same way about you and your ministry. And we have a little fun thing in common. We uh, are published through the same publisher, and we we actually have the same general editor. And uh, so, yeah, that's really cool. We got to work with the same people over there at Tyndale, great people. Uh, right. So, man, I want I want people to really get to know you. I want you to talk about your ministry. I want you to help us with this big evangelism question. But first, I really want people to get to know you through your story, because your story actually, we, we chatted about this for a few minutes before we went on the air, but your story kind of has a special meaning to me, because I grew up doing a lot of inner city ministry, where we would go in and do evangelism in rougher areas, and um, and you actually came to Christ out of a situation like that. So first, tell us about what your situation was growing up. Where did you grow up? Was it a Christian home? What was life like for you as a kid? Yeah, it was it was crazy. I, I As I say, when I preach, I don't come from a typical religious, church-going, pew-sitting, hymn-singing family. <laughs> I come from a family filled with bodybuilding, tobacco chewing, and beer-drinking thugs. And that's just the women. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, my, my family was, three of my uncles were competitive bodybuilders. The fourth one um, was a bouncer at the toughest bar in Denver. You know, every city's got a city. Yeah. And North Denver was the inner city of Denver, the highest crime area. My fifth uncle was a gold gloves boxer, judo champion, and war hero. And my mom was the only girl in the group. And they were all afraid of her because <laughs> she was strong and she used a baseball bat. And it was this crazy family that loved to fight. It were like a not organized crime, but disorganized crime. Yeah. And um, the mafia, the Denver mafia, the small dones, nicknamed my uncles the crazy brothers. So when the mafia thinks your family's dysfunctional. Yeah. It's not, it's not good. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's saying something. Wow. So you somehow, amidst all of that, ended up hearing the gospel. Tell us how that happened. And um, I know there's a, I mentioned there's a, a, a Yankee with a Southern accent involved here somewhere. Yeah. So tell us about how that happened. So I'm just, I'm just a scared little kid. Never knew my biological father. I was a result of a party. My mom met a guy at a party. They partied. She got pregnant. He found out he got transferred 2,000 miles away. She actually drove from Denver to Boston to abort me because she, or my grandparents were Christ, uh, Baptists and they, mm. she didn't want to stand and give an account. Changed her mind last minute, came back, had me, would always look at me with these just guilt and shame. She would just burst out in tears. And then she had rage against men um, mm. because she'd been used and abused, you know, her, uh, you know, her life. And one time uh, a guy in a brand new car pulled up 
and I was playing on the porch. I was five years old. I go, mommy, one of my daddies is here. It was one of the guys she had married and who had left us. And oh, she wow. ran out with a baseball bat, shattered his front windshield, took out his headlights, knocked off his mirror and dared him to get out. And he got out and she led him up, beat the tar out of him. Oh, wow. And he drove. Up. So I, it was just this violent family. Um, it actually really traumatized, you know, working on Unlikely Fighter, this book, a memoir as a preacher, as a communicator, you know this, you kind of call illustrations and then you use them to make your point. But when you write a memoir, you actually have to get in a time machine mm. and bring the audience with you. And it it really brought up a lot of stuff that I didn't know I had in my soul. So this violent family, the toughest one of my uncles was my Uncle Jack, who'd been in and out of jail his whole life, once for choking two cops unconscious at the same time who were trying to arrest him on assault charges. Um, and Yankee, this preacher from the Deep South, and I guess the backstory behind it is his daddy was a counterfeiter and a bootlegger. And Yankee was born on the run when the FBI was after his father uh, in Pennsylvania. So his dad nicknamed him Blank Yankee. I won't fill in the blank. Right? <laughs> and uh, he kept that, t that title his whole life, Yankee. So here's this guy who on a dare from another guy named Bob Daly who knew my uncle Jack, went to uncle Jack's house, knocked on the door. And Jack comes to the door, no shirt on, tats everywhere, two beer cans, one for spit and chew, one for beer. Dug like this. Looked like the Wolverine, a bigger version of the Wolverine. What do you want? He goes, uh, my name's Yankee Arnold. I'm here on a dare from Bob Daly to tell you about Jesus. He goes, well, I don't know Jesus. I know Bob. I'll give you five minutes. <laughs> he sit down at the table. He explains the gospel to him. Yankee explains a simple gospel. Jesus came for sinners. You put your faith in him. He died on the cross in your place for your sin. You trust in him alone. You have eternal life. And Yankee said, does that make sense? And he goes, hell yeah, that was it. I mean, wow. and my Aunt Earlene trusted Christ. Uncle Jack brought 250 people out to Yankee's church in one month. Now, I'm not exaggerating. One month, bodybuilders, street fight. And a, the domino effect began in my family. One by one, my tough uncles trained, equipped. I got involved in Yankee's youth ministry um, and was equipped to share the gospel. The first one on my heart was to share the gospel with my mom, who thought she was too sinful. Um, she would look at me and just begin to cry often. And I said, mom, it doesn't matter. For three years, I worked on her. And finally, at the age of 15, I was able to lead my mom to Christ. Wow. And uh, I asked her, where are you going to go to heaven when you, uh, where are you going to go when you die? She goes, I'm going to heaven, cigarettes and all. <laughs> heaven, <laughs> heaven's not smoking though, mom. And it's 17 years ago, Elisa, she went to be with the Lord and uh, somebody didn't know that she had died. They said, how's your mom? I go, she's doing good. She stopped smoking, best shape yeah. of her life, singing all the time. She's dead. And they're like, uh, but it's true. She's in heaven. Yeah. She's doing good. My whole family was radically transformed mm. by a preacher from the South, nicknamed Yankee, who was bold enough to share the gospel with my toughest uncle. Yeah. And, and then he trained us all how to share that good news. And that's, that's kind of what Dare to Share came out of, is just that that same passion um, yeah. for the power of the gospel. I love that. I love that. And that's obviously where the name Dare to Share came from, was the fact that Yankee was on a dare to share the gospel with your uncle. That is right. fabulous. So I assume that, now how old were you when this all happened? Well, I was eight when I trusted Christ as my Savior, and 15 when I was able to lead my mom to Christ. Okay, so 15. there was, you know, seven so did Seven you get, years, but, I know you said you joined Yankees Youth Ministry. Did you stay in that church for a long time and just be, obviously become discipled and and uh, and all that? So as you grew in your faith, were there things that you, you know, because obviously you're coming out of a very violent background. There's a lot of chaos and confusion going on in your, in your upbringing, in your home situation. Um, I would imagine that, you know, that first salvation moment, that, that first conversion moment was pretty radical in the sense that God is touching you in all these areas. But I imagine as you grew in your faith, um, the, you know, there comes maturity, there comes knowledge. And, and I wonder if you could share some of that journey a little bit, like, um, you know, as you learned what the Bible said, were there things that you uh, maybe had to kind of take a look at and say, well, maybe I, I don't think that's the right view, and maybe this one is, even among the people who gave you the gospel. Yeah, and so it was it was a really weird ministry in all the right ways, uh, most of the right ways. Um, they believe you should go deep into theology and go wide into evangelism. So I got a eight-volume systematic 
theology set, Lewis Berry Chafer, when I was 15 years old, somebody gave it to me. I read it. I wept wow. because for me, I didn't, I didn't know my heavenly father. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is my dad, you know, the dad I never had. And so for me, theology was never a cold study. It was knowing God and yeah. knowing truth. And I mean, they would encourage you and take you deep. I, I mean, I read biblical preaching by Haddon Robinson when I was 12 years old and I wasn't the exceptional kid. I mean, we, we were just one of many. They would train us, equip us in how to exegete scripture and how to, and then oh. how to share the gospel. And, but I remember Yankee one night when I was 13 years old, Sunday night service, he said, I want you to know this book well enough to rebel against me if I'm wrong. Oh wow! And what I began to realize when I graduated from this Christian school that Yankee had, that there was a lot of legalism there. Um, it was kind of, you're saved by grace, but you grow by, you know, yeah. the list. And really got more familiar with Chuck Swindoll and the Grace Awakening book and, you know, just walking by the power of the spirit. And uh, I remember leaving the church and I told Yankee, I said, I'm out of here. Uh, thanks for a solid foundation. Um, but, you know, this church is, it's legalistic. And <laughs> Um, you, he said, why are you doing this? I said, because you told me when I was 13 years old to know this book well enough to rebel against you if you're wrong. And I'm out of here. And so I, I left the church. And Yankee and I since have restored the relationship. He's still alive. I call him once a month. He's a joy-filled man who's still passionate about the gospel. And I tell him I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for you. So we we have a great relationship now. But I had to break away from some of the legalistic theology that came yeah. You know, along with it, because it's yeah. more of an independent, fundamental kind of church. Right, right. We thought Bob. We thought Bob Jones was a little, uh, little loose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Kinda. So I think that's something a lot of people can relate with, though, especially those who grew up in the church, because I think that, especially like in the 80s and 90s, it seemed like at that moment in church history, there was just a lot of legalism in evangelical culture. I know that. Um, I don't think my parents were in particular, very legalistic. Uh, maybe they had their areas. I think we all do. But, um, but you know, it just seemed to be in the air and in the culture. And I think that that's when I observe people who end up walking away from their faith, uh, it seems like sometimes that will be one of the reasons like, well, you know, Christianity is so legalistic. It's, it's just, it's all works and just bondage to rules and checking boxes and things like that. That's why I like that part of your story, because really what biblical authority gives us is a firm foundation, uh, when we when we trust that the Bible is the Word of God and it has final say about these yeah. things, then we can rest and know we don't have to throw the whole thing out because somebody else might have uh, overemphasized something or or underemphasized something. That's a, that's a, and that's exactly what we tell teens. The Word of God is inspired, therefore it's inerrant, therefore it's in charge. And you know, to 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 me, the issue of today is not inerrancy; it's authority. Mm. Is it? Do we really believe in the authority of God's word? I, and I, I go to the LGBTQ issue right away. Where do you stand on that? Because Scripture is very clear on on those issues, um, and so I think we have to we have to get back to the authority of Scripture and uh, really, you know, it's house rules. That's what I tell my kids. Whoever owns the house makes the rules. God owns the house; He makes the rules. Yeah. You know? That's good. Love that. The other thing, the other thing I would say in, in the midst of in the midst of all this is that <clears throat> I really feel like there was a because it was an independent fundamental church, there was a view of the Holy Spirit um, that was suspect, mm. almost like Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures. Mm. And you know, without the Spirit, we don't have life. And uh, we had a. It was interesting. There's a liberal like newspaper up and down the Rocky Mountain range called Westward Magazine. And it's very anti, you know, evangelical Christian, very, you know, very, very liberal. Well, they did a, they wanted to do years of, 12 years ago, wanted to do a, a story on Dare to Share, an expose. And so we invited their reporter to come with us on tour to interview my family. And they did a deep dive. I said, the only rule is nothing is off limits. <laughs> So you can ask anything. And um, it was interesting when the cover came out and this is a very popular magazine. And it was somebody like this with a halo around their head says, dare to share wants to save your soul. And it was, it was like 5,000 words or so. And they ended up saying, Hey, we don't agree with these guys, but we, we like them. Oh wow! And 
we we think they're sincere. They actually gotten some flack for for saying some of the nice things they said about us. Yeah. Um, and the one question that almost held them back was this: uh, their editors before they released it said, "We have we have a hard time thinking you didn't go through a time of rebellion." Mm. And I'm like, "Did you not hear my story? My whole life has been a story mm-hmm. of rebellion. I saw the other side of that." Yeah. I was like, I, "I don't want to have anything to do with it." So leaving the Christian faith has never entered my mind, and mm. I don't understand. I I honestly do not understand Christians that that leave the faith. Mm -hmm. uh over issues Uh, i'm like yeah there's hurt and pain you want to compare you want to compare lists i got a lot of hurt and pain to me that's a reason to lean even deeper into christ and deeper into the word and deeper into true christianity not legalism i mean yeah there's goofball stuff out there but that you don't you don't throw out this great gift of christianity because you know somebody some flawed person hurt you. Yeah. It seems like it's so interesting when you hear stories of people going through deconstructions and walking away from the faith. There's so often is like you can have one person who went through a very similar trial and then another person who went through a similar trial and it can send them in opposite directions. It can send one person radically into God and it can it can cause someone else to start questioning everything and walk away. It's just an interesting sort of phenomenon that we're seeing in our culture, isn't it? I think it's, I, I think if you look at James 1 differently, it says, you know, consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. And then it talks about let's let no one say when they're tempted, they're tempted of God for everyone is tempted when they're, you know, tempted by their sin and dra- dra- dragged away and enticed and sin brings forth death and death. You know, I mean, that whole passage, the bottom line of that passage is every challenge is either a trial to build us or a temptation that will destroy us. And I think some of these Christians have a trial, a problem, a situation. It can build them or destroy them. They make the call of whether or not it's going to be a trial that builds them closer to God or a temptation that drags them far away from God. And they'll have to stand up before God and give an account for that. So we need to use these problems as a way to lean into the Father uh, deep, you know, more. Yeah, that's really good. And you brought up an interesting point a moment ago that I want to camp on for a moment, uh, because I think it's going to help us with how we frame this whole conversation today. Uh, you talked about kind of navigating the tension between uh, biblical authority, legalism, Holy Spirit. You know, in your case, the people who are around you, it seemed like it was Father, Son, Holy Scriptures. And there, and then you, you see there are streams of Christianity where it's almost the opposite. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Scriptures, yeah, whatever, but it's like all about the Holy Spirit. And, and it seems like there's an imbalance in certain streams of Christianity. Mm-hmm. How did you personally navigate that tension as you grew in your faith? Well, Yankee, Yankee did a phenomenal job of laying author- the authority of God's word for us. I mean, he really did. And I mean, that became the authority. For, and even before I got saved, even before I knew Yankee, I my family was so violent and so loud. And my grandparents were Baptists, so they used to actually take me to church. I would take my Bible. Hold on real quick. This one. This one right here. And Look I would that. sit. I would sit with this Bible and a flashlight underneath the kitchen sink to get away from the noise. And I would read it because I knew the answers were here. Mm. This is before I met Yankee, before my family, you know, was wow. encountered. And then on June 23rd, 1974, my grandma wrote, you know, Greg Steer received Jesus Christ as his savior. Oh. And from the, you know, even before I met Yankee, that be, the, the anomaly to me was the Holy spirit. Mm. And, uh, Yankee had a little Bible college that he had started. It's kind of a womb to the tomb ministry, you know. And so I left. I went to Liberty. And it was there um, that, you know, I really learned about the Holy Spirit. I had one of the Christian school teachers, uh, Mark Schweitzer. He's what I call a grace dealer. Like he snuck me into a David Meese concert, which was, you know, <laughs> a no-no. All Christian rock was bad. Yeah. And and he would he would introduce me to Chuck Swindoll. Um, and so that it, even in high school started getting me kind of prepped. And then when I kind of left to go uh, and really learned about the power of the Holy spirit, you know, and never, you know, I'm not technically what, what others would call charismatic. Um, but I believe without the Holy spirit, we have no power. We have no yeah. life. We have no fruit. And so for me, the Holy spirit was a great discovery. Like, Wow. 
we've we got glycerin we got glycerin right <laughs> we need nitrogen yeah and nitrogen and glycerin the word of god and the spirit of god you yeah. know so you know i preach at a, a baptist church more conservative i'm like holy spirit don't forget the holy spirit i preach at a a charismatic church or pentecostal church word of god don't forget that's the word good. of god <laughs> You know, break down that dividing wall. I yeah, think Satan's good. doing everything he can to keep the word and the spirit separated. That's good. And that's how we train teams, man. We always talk about the word of God. We always talk about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, because your ministry is primarily directed at young people, which is so great because we need so much evangelism to go on with, with uh, young people today. Um, and, and I want to ask you a little bit about that, but maybe we can also frame it in the context of, uh, I am just going to sort of, you know, put my heart on my sleeve here a little bit and be vulnerable and say that I admit that in everyday life situations, sometimes I feel intimidated, or maybe it's that I don't know how, and it might just be because I'm really introverted. It's easy for me to talk into a camera or talk on a stage, mm -hmm. but when I have a real life person in front of me, you know, that that's harder for me just naturally. And that's not an excuse, but it's just a it's just something that is a challenge to me, you know, if I know that somebody doesn't know the Lord. To, how to open up that conversation. And, uh, you know, Greg Kokel's book, Tactics, has helped me a lot with that to, mm -hmm. to kind of break down some of those barriers. But I thought it would be so great to have you on because I suspect that it's not just me. And, and I'll give you a little background, too. I, I shared this with you before we went on the air. I grew up doing a lot of street uh, evangelism. And these are wonderful people. Are, they're, are, they're still out there doing it. So like, this is no criticism of them because they these people take homeless people into their own homes. And mm -hmm. I mean, n these are great, wonderful Christian people. But, but some of the methods, I remember even as a teenager, mm -hmm. walking down Hollywood Boulevard and handing out gospel tracts, and, and thinking, I don't know if this is the most effective way to go about this. I know, I know how this sounds to people when you're, you're talking about some really radically countercultural ideas and you just walk up to someone on, on the street and just start saying it. And then, of course, your story of Yankee on a dare. Hi, my name's Yankee. I'm, I'm dared to come share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. You know, there are a lot of people who would say, that scares that scares the, the the life out of me to think about doing something like that. So maybe you can walk us through, um, you know, what maybe define evangelism in the sense yeah. like, is that what it is? Just walking around giving out tracks, or is there? I know that you you've got this all really thought through. This is what you train teens in doing. But help us understand what is evangelism and why is it something that obviously some people are more gifted in it than others, but everybody's called to it. So how do yeah. we how do we break down those barriers and just do it? <laughs> yeah. So let me reframe things a little bit. You know, if we had the cure to COVID, we somehow discovered the cure in our microwave, like, oh, this is the cure. We would share that cure with everybody we knew, right? Yeah. We wouldn't even hesitate. If we had the cure to cancer, we would share We would share it. We have the cure to something infinitely worse than COVID or cancer, mm. you know, and people that, that uh, don't have that cure are headed somewhere infinitely worse than death. Um, and so we need to realize there's gospel urgency. And I know here's the way I frame evangelism, because I know there's some, you know, people that are more reformed or Arminian, they get nervous about this, but I call it three dot theology. Dot number one is it's God's responsibility to save. Salvation comes from the Lord, right? Jonah 2, 9. Dot number two, it's our responsibility to share, because how will they hear without a preacher? Dot number three, it's their responsibility to believe. Romans 1, they're without excuse. And the key is don't connect the dots. Mm. Own your dot. And your dot is to share the gospel with people that God puts in your pathway. And and sometimes that's neighbors, family, friends. Sometimes that is a stranger. And so evangelism is the clear proclamation of the gospel message, right? Uh, delivered verbally. I know some people say St. Francis of Assisi said, which I don't think he actually did, preach the gospel if necessary, use words. We've adopted that statement and changed it to preach the gospel. It's necessary, use words. I love that. And he did so, not say that. I did a deep dive okay. research on that. I have a good. blog post on my website. He never said that. Good, good. Well, he didn't say that, but that's falsely attributed to him. And that's how that's how a lot of Christians approach. Like, yeah. I'm just going to live the gospel. Well, I tell people, hey, I just, I just flew back from Chicago yesterday. I'm sure glad I didn't have a one-winged airplane 
because we'd have never got off the ground. Evangelism, you know, you want to live it. That's one wing and you want to give it verbally. We always say out loud with words. Mm -hmm. That's the other wing. I don't know how God infused divine power into a stick that Moses used to stretch across the Red Sea, to touch the Nile, to hold up over the Midianites, to defeat them in battle, to launch the 10 plagues, but God did. I don't know how God infused divine power into a message. It's above my pay grade. Mm. But when we proclaim out loud with words the gospel message, it's got power. But just like if you take a vitamin, right? You take a vitamin, uh, there's some things you can do within that vitamin. I don't know all the scientific terms that will make those vitamins get, actually get into your system. Mm -hmm. And so we have this message, this gospel message, but how do we actually get it in as opposed to run up and give a, somebody a gospel track and run away How to or stand on the street corner and scream at people? Mm -hmm. A for effort, probably F for strategy, right? Yeah. How do we do that? And so I dare to share we really encourage teenagers, don't make a gospel presentation, get into a gospel conversation, right? And so the way that we do that is we, we use three words, ask, admire, admit. Mm. Ask questions, get to know somebody. Talk about, hey, where's a good place to eat around here? Or where are you from? Or what do you do? And just in a normal conversation with somebody. If I see people with tats, I always say, tell me what those tattoos mean. And it begins a conversation that usually leads to the gospel um, because I'm trusting in the Holy Spirit. The first one I ask is, God, fill me with your spirit because mm. I'm scared. I've been doing this for over 40 years, evangelism. I still get nervous every time. And I'm so glad, Elisa, because it makes me depend on the Holy Spirit. That's good. And that's when you see the Acts 1-8 Holy Spirit power. Then find out what they believe. This is when you lean in a little bit into the awkward. So you're talking two, three minutes and you could ask a question like, hey, is there any way I can pray for you? You know, I'm a Christian. Is there any way I can pray? Or do you go to church anywhere around here? Which is awkward. Or do you believe in God? Do you have any spiritual beliefs? But by then you're talking, so it's not quite as awkward. Uh, but we say you have to lean into the awkward. Mm. Own it. We have a t-shirt at Dare to Share. This is awkward is awesome. Because <laughs> Jesus was the Prince of Peace and the King of Awkward. Uh, <laughs> go get your husband. I don't have a husband. Yeah, you've had five husbands and the dude you're shacking up with now is not your husband. That's awkward, right? Yeah. But that was after two minutes of conversation about a drink of water. So Jesus, you can do cold turkey relational re, re, evangelism in a relational way. And so I think you get to love people, care, ask questions, get into their spiritual beliefs, and then admire what you can. Don't start with the apologetics, finish with the apologetics. Do what Paul did in Acts 17. Hey, I see you're very religious to the, the men of the Areopagus, the philosophers. You, I even see an altar to an unknown God. Let's talk about it. So build on, hey, one thing I appreciate about Muslims is, man, you guys pray five times a day. Or Mormons, man, you guys are all about the mission. And you have excellent cardio because of the biking. <laughs> um, or, or whatever, you know, you're, you're kind of, and then admit, admit the reason you're a Christian is you're so messed up, you needed Jesus to save you. And that's where you tell your story, and then you get into the gospel story. And then we have a strategy to actually share the gospel message. But ask, admire, admit. And I'll tell you who's helped me with this, Elisa, is my, my wife. My, I was the guy when I went into the mall, because I, I was raised going every Friday night. Friday night, soul went it. Man, we'd go out to the mall and talk to teenagers. When I, went, when I got married to my wife, Debbie, I'd say, let's go to the mall and witness, witness, witness. She goes, no, let's go to the mall and shop, shop, shop. You can witness, I'll shop, because that's not my style. And what I've realized is evangelism is like a teeter-totter, right? Some of us are more relational. Some of us are more relentless. And it's okay mm. because we ask the Holy Spirit to sit on the other side of the teeter-totter. So he'll make more relational people bolder and he'll make more relentless people more relational. That's great. And so that's what we do and really try to, you know, there's no excuse. I mean, sometimes we know, I think we have to have, we need to crank up our urgency. Mm. We are in a battle with Satan for the souls of people around us. And God has placed us in a neighborhood, uh, maybe at that restaurant, um, you know, at a job so that we can be witnesses with our life and with our lips. So ask, admire, admit. And also just as a total side note, uh, we have an app at Dare to Share oh, called great. Life in Six Words. 
These are where active gospel conversations are happening across the U.S. Those who are listening by audio, take it by faith. But literally, <laughs> you just ask somebody, if you were to describe your life in six words, what would they be? They choose the words out of 14. And then you ask them, tell me why you chose those words. People open up their lives. It's oh, crazy. Wow. So you pull out your you phone say, when you're talking to somebody and you do that. And yeah. you say, choose the words that describe you. That Because everybody loves to talk about themselves. They do. And I've had people break, strangers break down in tears. Now, I don't just walk up to them and say, let me show you an app. I talked to them for a little bit. And then I said, can I show you this app? It's called Life in Six Words. How would you describe your life in six words? And then I share my six words. That's where I tell my testimony. If we have any words in common, they show up. And then I say, can I share with you God's words? And then... The, we use a gospel acrostic, uh, God, our sins, paying everyone life. You know, God created us uh -huh. to be with him. Then yeah, for anyone listening who's not watching on uh, on uh, video, what what that says, when, when you go to God's words, it's uh, God created us to be with him. It shows up on the screen that way. And then there's a series of other, uh, our sins yeah. separate us from God. So it has these statements that sort of lay out the gospel. And so what's the name of this app if somebody wants to download it? Yeah, it's Life in Six Words. Life in six it words. Is the num numeric six, and it's in twelve different languages right now. Um, I, I I changed it to Spanish to talk to this uh, lady who only spoke Spanish, and it's Cristo instead of gospel in mm. Spanish. And she went through the C R I, and she's reading these statements, and she's bawling. And we get to the O. She kept saying C C C, and by the time we get to the O, the last part of the gospel, which by the way, it's the meta narrative. So we tell the story from Genesis one to Revelation twenty two in six sentences, because this generation needs to hear the whole story of the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the death of Christ, the, his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, paying the price for sin is the the epicenter of that. But she gets to the O. And she's just bawling. And I didn't know how to actually, what do I say then? I go, El Trusto Cristo. And she's <laughs> like, see, and she just fell in my arms Aww. and just was and, and crying. And it, it was, it was like the power of the gospel. And yeah. here's the thing. They're all people are all around us that desperately need this hope, you know? So what we do is with apologetics. So another way to describe it is take off to touchdown. So, how do we take off, right? Ask, admire, admit, right? What's our flight plan? G-O-S-P-E-L, the gospel message, right? How do we deal with turbulence? Apologetics. So we have mm. apologetics training. Uh, and if it gets beyond our pay grade, we say, go to your, <laughs> go to Elisa Childers, right? Oh. <laughs> go to Sean McDowell. And then how do you land the plane? You know, and we have two questions. Does that make sense? And is there anything holding you back from trusting in Jesus right now? So it's all on daretoshare.org. We have free curriculum training oh. and we train teens, but I was a pastor for 10 years. So a lot of the same stuff we use to train adults. I preach in churches across the nation and train their adults how to share the gospel. I train pastors because I, they don't not learn this stuff in seminary. It's yeah. crazy to me. Yeah. How would you, it's like becoming a football player, not learning, not knowing how to tackle. Mm -hmm. Like this is basic, basic stuff. Yeah, and but I'm just gonna I'm gonna put everybody. a little plug in for you as a speaker. I've watched some videos of you speaking live. You are a dynamic speaker, and oh, uh, just for anybody watching and listening, if you want to just get the fire started for evangelism in your church, definitely bring Greg in to speak to your staff or your people. Um, really, really great and awesome information, as you can tell from just the conversation we're having here today. Uh, so, Greg, there, you know, I imagine that, you know. The, the, well, obviously, the cultural climate has changed in the 25 to 30 years since, you know, you got saved and, and first heard the gospel message. And, and of course, you've been so involved in evangelism for all these years. What do you think has changed as far as um, what makes it maybe more difficult to share the gospel today or maybe more what are some challenges that are different today than when you first got started? How has that sort of morphed for you as, as far as the methodology of sharing the gospel according to what's going on in culture? Well, I mean, <clears throat> you used to be able to speak on common ground, like, because people generally believe the Bible was the Word of God. Um I actually, when I started sharing the gospel, the G was not God created us to be with him. It was God says everyone has sinned. So we started in Genesis 3. Right. Um, and we ended with L, um, 
life eternal can never be lost. And it was more, more about eternal security than it was a relationship. And now the L is life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. And so I heard a guy named Mike Metzger 20 years ago do a talk on reaching the, uh, you know, the upcoming generation of young people. And he said, you got to tell the whole story of the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. So we've kind of been adjusting that gospel acrostic over 30 years. The other thing adjustment we made is the word alone. So we have the, and the E is everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. And we emphasize that word because we become more Hindu than Christian. Mm. You know, I, my first series of preaching tour was in India, preached 56 times in 18 days to Hindu children, uh, teenagers, and in Catholic schools. And I had to use a chair. I had to put a chair up there on the stage and ask them when I, when I was through with the gospel, I put one foot on the chair. I said, am I fully trusting in this chair? And they said, no. And I said, what do I have to do? And that, you know, thousand plus kids would yell, stand upon the chair. And I'd stand on the chair. I go, now am I trusting fully in this chair? Yes. And I said, listen, to become a Christian, you can't have one foot on Jesus and one foot on your other gods. Both feet need to be on him and him alone. I'd never had to really do that 30 years ago as much. But today, I mean, G just like Hindus, teenagers will incorporate Jesus into this worldview made up of other gods or different worlds. But we have to, I use that illustration again uh, when I'm speaking to crowds, both feet on Jesus, trusting him alone. Um, and I also think you could be a little bit more direct back then. So we were a little bit more method, you know, ask two questions. Do you know you're going to go to heaven if I could tell you? Would that be good news? Boom, you're in. Now I think you have to, you know, it's with the average kid, you have to back up a little bit. And I think the ask, admire, admit gives gives you a little bit yeah. of runway to begin that. But the good news is kids are open to talk. Teenagers are open to talk about spiritual things. They really yeah. are. So that's, that's cool. the, on the positive side. You know, I mean, they... I hardly ever see teenage our teenagers that we train get totally shut down just to talk to any other teenagers at all. They want to talk about stuff. That's interesting. Uh, I know that one subject that might be particularly uh, interesting to my viewers and listeners would be evangelism in the context of something like a, a progressive Christianity or a new age type spirituality. When you know you go to share the gospel with somebody who already thinks they're a Christian. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I, this is sort of really on my mind right now because I'm walking a small group, very small group, through reading Richard Rohr's The Universal Christ so that we can process it, we can figure out how to answer it biblically. Um, and, and it's so interesting that the way that Christianity is framed in this book and is framed among many progressive Christians is that, hey, Christianity is just the realization that you were never separated from God in the first place. You know, you need to mm -hmm. get rid of all that baggage, that evangelical baggage, and realize that your sin doesn't separate you from God. You're beloved by God. You just need to realize it. You know, being a Christian means that you see Christ in everything and in everyone. How would you navigate a, co a gospel conversation like that when, you know, you're trying to share the basics and they're like, oh, no, we've been there, done that. We're, we're, we've moved on to more enlightening things and, and something, or something like that. Oh, I, I take him to the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, I always say, you know exactly, you can know exactly where Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount because there's flowers growing there because everybody pooped their pants as soon as they <laughs> heard this. It was yes. the most beautiful, terrifying sermon yes. ever. And Jesus, man, when you're in Matthew 5, um, I mean, he's talking about you have heard, but I say to you, you have heard, but I say to you, you've heard, you know, don't, don't commit adultery. I say, if you've ever lusted, I mean, there's so much in there yeah. that is totally, I mean, before Jesus came and preached a clear gospel, he preached a clear law. Mm. He really did. And um, that law breaks you down and makes you realize I'm a sinner and I need a savior. And even those that don't accept the Ten Commands, as Paul says in Romans 2, there's a law in them, built in them, and that's their conscience. That's why when I was a roofer for eight years, right? And Everybody knew I was a Christian because I share Christ with everybody. And if somebody cursed in front of me, they would say, I'm sorry. And I would say, you're not apologizing to me. You're apologizing to the Holy Spirit who dwells in me, who convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And they usually curse again, like, oh, blank. You know? yeah. But they knew down deep inside. So I think you have to take people back to the words of Jesus in Scripture, which are very clear. You know, I am the way 
and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I mean, if you go to Luke 16, 19 through 31, and he tells a story about the rich man and Lazarus, it is very clear that Jesus believes in a literal hell and mm-hmm. people that die without Christ, because he's warning his audience. So, liter- I mean, they have no, no grounds to stand on unless they're just going to piecemeal what they like out of Scripture. Yeah, no, that's good. And I think that's so key is uh, just in it, conversations I've had with progressive Christians, it, going back to the words of Jesus is so key because so often Jesus himself refutes so much of what's being taught in the movement of progressive Christianity, you know, the Bible's not the Word of God. Well, Jesus called it the Word of God over and over again. You know, yeah. Jesus didn't die on the cross as a substitute for our sins. Well, in the upper room, he said he was the suffering servant from Isaiah 53. Read Isaiah 53. Yeah. So I think that's that's the—I I, I appreciate that answer because I think that really is a key thing to go back to— biblical authority in general, but especially the words of Jesus with someone who is this, is calling themselves a Jesus follower, yet disagreeing with Jesus on some really key core gospel issues. So, yeah, so I always say, which Jesus are you talking to? Are you talking about the Jesus of the Bible? Like, let's talk about that. Oh. Yeah. And, and he was somebody to contend with. He was extremely loving and kind. But some would think he would be mean. There's a book that came out years ago called Jesus Mean and Wild. And it just talked about like, you know, he was much more intense than we give him credit. I mean, two different times, once at the beginning of his earthly uh, ministry, and once at the end, he cleaned out the temple with a whip flipping over tables. I read in one commentator, they estimate up to 5,000 money changers and all that stuff in the temple area that Jesus cleaned out. I mean, wow. he, had a, he had a streak in him of not meanness, but holiness and um, not a streak. I mean, he was that, that core of his being was, mm. is holiness and love and mercy and grace and compassion and justice. And yeah, yeah he's, he's someone to contend with. Yeah, you know? that's good. What do you think, you work a lot with youth, and I imagine there's people watching and listening today who have young people in their lives, whether it's their children or it's a friend or maybe, you know, they're a teacher and they're, they've got some kids in their classroom. What do you think is one of the biggest stumbling blocks to teens sharing their faith with other teens? Because I would imagine with young people, to it, it can be maybe less of a... I don't know, a, a stumbling block to hear the gospel from someone who's your peer than, you know, your pastor, your teacher, or your parent or somebody. Um, what, what do you think that roadblock is where teens might hesitate to share the gospel with someone their own age? Well, I think there's a lot of roadblocks. One roadblock is probably they don't see mom and dad doing it. Mm, you know, that's a I mean, big one. We don't see it. They don't hear their pastors talking about it. Uh, the youth pastors in their own personal life. No teacher is, a, you know, Jesus said, you know, no student is above their teacher when they're fully trained to be like their teacher. It's interesting to me, all this talk, there's all this education on theology and apologetics, which I appreciate, and, you know, worldview. But here's the deal, is if a student does not <clears throat> share the gospel, there, it's, like taking, it's like taking milk and pouring it into a sponge. If I take milk and I pour it into a sponge, if they don't, if I don't wring that out, it's going to rot. Mm. We have all this, the milk of God's word being poured into brains. And that's what the whole answer, everybody's like, well, we just need more theology, more truth. It's just more milk that we're, if they don't pour it out, they're, it's going to rot. Mm. Christians, my, my kids go to a Christian school. I love the Christian school. It smells like rotten milk. Because mm. there's kids with a lot of content, but they don't pour it out. So I really think we need to reframe discipleship with evangelism as the 101 class. What's the first thing that happened? I'll give you a quiz. I know you know the Bible. So here, when a believer got saved, you know, what's the first thing that happened to them? Almost inevitably. What did they do? They prayed a prayer or they trusted in Jesus? Now, after that. So what what happened to them? Well, they, they begin a relationship with Jesus. They (laughs) <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm failing I'm the quiz. <laughs> they got baptized. Right. <laughs> no, before we pass that by, they got baptized right away. You don't see delayed baptisms. Yeah. 3,000 are added to the number that day. If you look in uh, NIV text notes of Romans 10, if you confess with the mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, you're saved. Your heart, you believe in, are justified, your mouth, declare saved. 
I don't think that confession is talking about justification because that's what you do in your heart. I think it's talking about sanctification. NIV text notes talk about Jesus as Lord as being the baptismal confession. And you stood in the water. Mm. You didn't stand in that hiding in the church. It was in the mitvahs on the you know southern steps when all your friends were going, or the Jordan where people were coming down and getting water. You got baptized in public. Even the Ethiopian eunuch, his charioteers, whoever was riding those, driving those chariots, they heard that baptismal confession. That's a microcosm of evangelism. Jesus is Lord. I'm, I believe in him. The first thing you did as a new believer is declared the gospel message, a microcosm of that message. And I think that accelerated. So mm. what's the, I'll give you another quiz to see if you pass this one. Oh All gosh, right. I hope so. What did Jesus say? If you want to be a disciple, you got to pick up something. Your cross. I'm making this easy. Okay, 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 I got it. Okay, you're back. You're back. To um, <laughs> pick up your cross, die to yourself, and follow me. Well, that first death is not a physical death. That first death is a social death. Mm. Evangelism forces teenagers to pick up their cross publicly, die to themselves. So James 2, let me give you a different passage. James 2, was not our father Abraham willing to, uh, sac uh, you know, um, when he was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar, his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete or mature by what he was willing to do. Um, that's 25 years after he believed God and counted to him as righteousness in Genesis 15. This is in Genesis 22. He's willing to put his son on the altar. After 25 years of spiritual growth, he offers everything. His faith and actions are working together. His faith was matured by what he was willing to do because he put what meant most to him on the altar. What means most to the average teenager is how they're perceived by their peers. Wow. Evangelism forces them to put that on the altar. Mm. So dare to share. We train students. We all go out and pray, care, share, serve the neighborhood, share the gospel. But before we do that, we have them use that Life in Six Words app to send a what we call a quick starter, which is a social media post to their friend and begin a gospel conversation. Wow. And it puts it on the line. I think we got it backwards in the U.S. I think that's why the trajectory of the rejection of the historic Christian faith is skyrocketing. We're depending on these traditional, additional approaches. Just invite your friends out to youth group. Well, less and less kids are coming out to youth group because they can play games on their phone right now, and they get their friends through their social media contacts, and they're busy. Mm. So if we, but we have to combine. Come and see. I'm for you know, bring your friends out with go and get. Mm. go and tell. And when students do that, so the other thing, let me just back up real quick. I think we need to reframe the Great Commission as the great cause. We call it the cause. We do a full week training in the summer called Lead the Cause because teenagers are into causes, but we have failed to frame making disciples as the ultimate cause. So we, we what we tell teens is, hey, how many of you guys are passionate about stopping human trafficking? Amen. Stop human trafficking and stop soul trafficking mm. because Satan is the ultimate trafficker. He's been trafficking a generation two and through hell, right, for thousands of years. Uh, how many of you guys are passionate about feeding the hungry? Well, give the hungry bread and the bread of life. Mm. Give the thirsty water and the living water. Build the homeless a house on earth and one in heaven. And if you help teens see the cause of Christ as the ultimate cause and everything as a worthy subset that will lead to making and multiplying disciples, now you got a movement on your hands. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing at Dare to Share. We got almost 1,200 churches signed up for a simulcast we're doing on November 13th, where teens will be simultaneously trained and equipped and mobilized for the gospel for seven hours on a Saturday. Um, and I mean, we could have tens of thousands of churches, November 13th, mobilized for the gospel of Christ. And that will strengthen them. People say, yeah. what about discipleship? I'm like, that is discipleship because these kids are going to risk to grow just like you did on the streets of new york yeah you know when you were doing evangelism that builds your faith it does right? yeah and and you can do that you can do jesus proved in john 4 with the woman at the well you can do cold turkey in a relational way by See. getting into a conversation so tell people where they can get connected with that uh, that training that you're going to be doing on November 13th. How can they uh, sign up for that? Yeah, it's uh, Dare to Share Live. It's the number two, dare to share live .org, org. Just go there. There's three requirements. Uh, you have to have internet. You have to have adult leaders to help lead the way. And you, you have to do the outreach. This ain't no watch party. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're going to do. It's a do party, right? That's good. So, 
moms and dads can do it with their own kids. You know, I take my my daughter and a group of her friends out once a month, last Saturday of every month. We call it Go Share Day and groups around the world doing it just to, I want to lead the way for my kids, you know, and, and, and so parents could do that. Youth leaders, pastors, uh, again, it's dare to share live.org. And when does your book come out? Tell us about a little bit about your book, where people can find it. Is there, if there's a pre-order or just yeah. uh, let us know about, about that. So unlikely fighter comes out, um, got the first copy yesterday. It smells so good. Anyway, nice. um, got a, uh, comes out November 9th. And uh, it's 22 chapters long. The first 21 chapters happened before I turned 16. Uh, Lee Strobel wrote the foreword. So that was kind of it's like having Bruce Lee write in the foreword of your Kung Fu manual. That's right. <laughs> and uh, he wrote the foreword of your book. Too. He did, yeah. yeah. And uh, he's he's the man. And That's awesome. uh, such a nice man. So yeah, it comes out and tells the story. It's it's my first general market book to adults. Um but I think teens would get something out of it too. And it's also a book you could pass to an unbeliever because the gospel's given at least three different times in, in a story form when I'm yeah. telling stories of my family coming to Christ. So I got a chapter good. on Uncle Jack, chapter on my mom, chapter on just, yeah, dive deep into the the dysfunction that was my upbringing. It yeah. preaches really well. Yeah, well, yeah, because you see the power of the gospel transform lives in a in a very significant and real way. That's very cool. So if people just, you know, Google Unlikely Fighter, Greg Steer, S-T-I-E-R, it'll pop up, sold at Amazon, sold on our website, Barnes & Nobles, wherever books are sold, as, Great. as they say. Isn't it fun to say that? Wherever books are sold. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, in a moment, we're going to go to our Patreon sort of hangout after party. What that is about is for people who are followers and supporters on Patreon, after every podcast episode, we do a little five to 10 minute hangout where they get to ask the question. So if you want to be a part of that, you can go to patreon.com slash Alisa Childers. You can take a look at the different tiers. There's different benefits. Uh, for tier three, it'll get you early access to podcasts before they come out. Tier four uh, will get you that extra episode. Tier 5 gets you a free book, uh, which right now is another gospel, which is my current book. But in about a year, that will be replaced with the next book that I have coming out called Live Your Truth and Other Lies, How Popular Deceptions Are Making Us Anxious, Self-Obsessed, and Exhausted. So you can take a look at that at patreon.com slash Alisa Childers to join in for that after party. But Greg, as we close out this section of our discussion, what, what kind of practical takeaways would you leave our viewers and listeners with today as we frame this discussion of like, let's get over ourselves, let's get out and have these. And I'm talking to myself because because I need that challenge. I need that that kick in the pants myself. But what, what are some practical takeaways you can leave us with today? Pray every day, God, give me an opportunity today to share the hope of your son with somebody and, uh, and take that opportunity when he gives it because that's a prayer that he loves to answer yes. That's awesome. Very good. Well, I want to thank my guest today, Greg Steer. Don't forget to check out his book, Unlikely Fighter, and go to daretoshare.org. Sign up for that training that's happening uh, coming up soon, very soon, and help get equipped to kind of get over this fear that some of us might have in sharing the gospel with people, because uh, I think one of the biggest takeaways I have from today's episode is it really does build your faith. I experienced that in a tangible way as a teenager, even as if I didn't necessarily think that the method may, might have been that effective. It did have an effect on me and my faith, and it really built my faith up. So thank you so much for watching today. If you're watching on YouTube, hitting that subscribe button, leaving a comment, a like, all of that helps. If you are listening on an audio platform like iTunes, if you want to jump over to iTunes and leave a five-star review, that really helps. It really ends up at the end of the day getting the word out to more people because it affects algorithms and things like that. So for now, thank you so much for watching today. Today. We've got some great shows coming up. Lee Strobel is going to be on. We're going to be talking with TC Cannon about spiritual abuse. So definitely subscribe so you don't miss any of those things. But thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time. <laughs>